Let me start with a question. This is a serious question. What do we truly care about? So I know lots of things, but I'm guessing that for almost all of you, these guys are some of the things or the people that you really care about, our children. And I'm guessing this applies whether or not you're a parent. We value our children very highly, and we want to give them a, we want to help them to grow into healthy adults. Second question. Who here loves their work? That kind of most people, <laughs> maybe not everybody, but aren't we lucky? Isn't it amazing that most of us can get out of bed in the morning, do things that we enjoy all day, and be paid for it? <laughs> that is a joy and a privilege as well. So, putting two and two together, let me just show you this little video that... Um, I'm just going to show you the first half of this video for two reasons. One is it encapsulates, as best I can, putting these two things together. And the second is that it's readily available um, um, on, the, on the internet. And I think you may find it useful, because I'm going to encourage you to talk to schools, you may find it useful in opening a conversation with them. So this is four minutes worth um, of uh, I'm Simon Payne Jones. I'm the chair of the new National Center for Computing Education. And I'm here to talk about why it's so important that computing should be a fundamental part of every child's education from primary school onwards. But first, let me just get into character. Oh, that's better. I'm a research computer scientist. I work for Microsoft's research lab in Cambridge. But my interest in computing education started when I was talking to my children about their studies in what was then called ICT. And I couldn't make a connection between what they were studying at school and the subject discipline that I thought was so interesting that I devoted my professional life to it. That led to the creation of the Computing at School grassroots guerrilla movement for reforming the then ICT curriculum, which was more successful than any of us expected, to the point where I ended up chairing the working group that wrote the new program of study, something whose implications I think we are still working out. Based on the Royal Society's report, Shutdown and Restart, in 2012, the UK is now engaged in probably the most ambitious re-envisioning of computing as a school subject that is taking place anywhere in the world. The new English program of study establishes computer science as a foundational discipline that all children should study at an elementary level as they do natural science or mathematics from primary school onwards. This will turn them from the slaves of technology into its masters. It'll turn them from mere consumers of technological stuff into its creators. But that presents schools and teachers with a huge challenge because they were never trained to teach computer science and our knowledge of its pedagogy is as yet quite limited. So the National Center is particularly important here. Its main goal is to support and equip and encourage and provide resources for schools and teachers to turn that short, dry national curriculum into a rich, vibrant reality in every classroom in the land from age six through to age 18. So why should we teach computing as a compulsory subject to every child from primary school onwards? At school we try to teach children something about technologies and skills which are of direct and immediate practical use, but we also teach them about foundational subject disciplines. And we do that so that they'll be able to use underlying ideas to survive and thrive in a world of rapid technological change. And it's just the same with computing in which technology is changing particularly rapidly, and so it's particularly important to have some understanding of the underlying ideas and subject discipline. And I think this is important for us as a society, as well as for each of us as individuals. For us as a society, it's important for us to take judgments about what is good or less good in the light of knowledge about the underlying technology. Take the subject of AI, which is very topical at the moment. Should we be worried about the surveillance society? Should we be worried about AI taking all of our jobs? If we have no idea how AI works, we have no basis on which to take such judgments. But are those judgments are much too important to be left to a handful of geeks. We must have a broadly based enough technological understanding of what's going on to take well-informed judgments as a society. And it makes a huge difference for us as individuals. It's not just the software developers of the future. Across a huge range of professions, 
every child will need to make some use of computing technology. And if they understand how that technology works, they will be much more able to do those jobs and to get those jobs, and they will be, find those jobs much more rewarding and interesting. I think of computing as a kind of ladder into the top half of the hourglass that our employment economy has become with highly skilled jobs at the top and low skilled jobs at the bottom. It's hugely empowering for us as individuals and for us as a society. So this is the vision. When I said at the beginning, this is the largest single revolution in computing education taking place anywhere in the world, I don't think any other country has articulated it as crisply as our country has. And I think that's something that we could be quite proud of. So here it is that uh, computer science is a foundational discipline that we want to teach to all of our children from primary school onwards, just as we teach natural science and mathematics. And for the same reasons, why do we teach children, say, biology at primary school? Is it because they're going to all become biologists? No, not all of them will. But if you don't understand anything about biology, it's not, you, you can't operate as an empowered citizen taking well-informed judgments about the world. So it's really important that it's foundational. And that's very different to thinking of it as purely a vocational skill that will just enable you to get a good job. OK. So if we're to articulate that picture, we must say, what is computer science, a foundational subject? What does it mean at primary school, um, or at secondary school, at school level anyway? So I've tried to, I try to articulate this in the, um, uh, in the following way. Computer science is about uh, computation and information and communication. So let's start with information. Here's a, here's a, um, a picture. Here's two, which of these two pictures has more information in it? The, the top one, because, and the way I think of it is, imagine that you were uh, on a phone call to somebody and you were trying to get them to reproduce at the other end of the phone line one of these pictures. It would be a lot easier to do this one. You could do it in about you know, two minutes. This one would be really hard. right? So there's some notion about how much information. And indeed, you might then ask, is it a measurable quantity? Um, and indeed, you can. There's a whole thing about information theory. So information, um, and the, you know, this is, sort of gets into data science as well. Information computation. So this is more traditional sort of algorithm stuff. right? So this is the shortest path algorithm for the, for the traveling salesman. I really like this example because it's pretty easy to see what the problem is. We know that it's NP complete, which sounds scary, but it just means that the only way that we currently know to find the shortest path takes time exponential in the number of cities. And an exponential can get awfully big awfully quickly. So in fact, no computer in the universe, no, in the, in the, well, in the world, can solve this if you give it enough cities. You just got to add one more. You make it a lot harder. And yet, there are clever approximation algorithms, like simulated annealing, that only take 10 lines of code and can solve this problem in a jiffy. Well, can get an approximate solution. So that's a wonderful sort of little, you, know, can, you can explore that at school level quite easily. Um, and it's, uh, for me, it's just amazing that this sort of combination of approximation and, and, and NP hardness. Let me show you another example of an algorithm treated at school. This is about sorting. Um, this video was made by Tim Bell in New Zealand. Um, it's a, uh, a bunch of children um, uh, walking over a sorting network on the ground. When two children meet at one of these boxes, um, here two children are meeting, the six is bigger than the two, so they swap places. Um, so now if they all stand um, at the beginning, it's a, um, this is a parallel algorithm, in fact. It's a parallel distributed algorithm with interprocess communication. Thank you, Erlang. Um, they will, uh, and if they follow the rules, they will emerge um, sorted. All right, and that's, you know, we think that's quite cool, and even the Secretary of State for Education thinks that's quite cool. It's apprehensible by everybody. You can do it as a competition. You can do it at a larger scale. Tim tells me this video, which is only 10 seconds, took him all morning to, to film because it's really hard doing it with 40 children. Um, so why do I show this? Well, because this is, there's lots of nice things about this. It's, um, it's clearly clever, right? There's something interesting going on. It's a parallel algorithm. Um, it's, uh, it's something that doesn't involve computers. There's no computers in sight. It's only children walking past each other. So clearly, we're not going to be seduced by the technology. All the emphasis on the cleverness. 
It's an algorithm where, you, where children, you can encourage children to experiment. They could say, oh, maybe the teacher made us come out sorted by putting us in a clever way to start with. Perhaps if we mixed ourselves up to begin with, we could fool the teacher and come out unsorted. No. Every input combination does come out sorted. Could you do the same thing with fewer boxes and wires? Would different arrangements of boxes and wires work? And all of these things, while they might have quite deep answers if you wanted to prove something, are quite experimentally explorable. See the idea? And it's all done by primary children, primary school children in their socks. Information, computation, communication. Again, uh, so. Uh, uh, Erlang is a language that um, we were talking about, Joe, earlier, that specializes in communication. This is sort of fundamental um, idea. So here's my favorite communication analogy. Bill and Jane have never met before. They want to have a private conversation in a room full of very nosy eavesdroppers. If they could share a secret key, they could encrypt their conversation. We kind of all know that. But they don't share a secret key. They have never met. Could they have a conversation in public at the end of which they each know the same secret key, but none of the eavesdroppers do. Doesn't that seem implausible? Just I kind of, when I first came across this, I thought, obviously impossible. But it's called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. It's done by your computer every time it does a little secure um, communication with, uh, uh, you know, with Amazon. And, um, and it's explicable using kind of GCSE level mathematics. No more than modular arithmetic. It really isn't that hard. And that's amazing, right? So it's sort of the concentrated cleverness of computer science coming out here. So information, computation, communication. Um, and moreover, it's not just hardcore computer science. I often uh, show this sort of interdisciplinary stuff, particularly important at primary school, right? So the rules of this game are, you put your finger on a dot and you say the word as you move it and you move to the next dot. So a huge dog danced and uh, the big pirate sang and you can come out here. So you can generate English language sentences like that and it's not long after you show children this, they start writing their own little networks that generate sentences, usually rude ones. But um, we would recognize this as a finite state automaton, right, which comes up all over computer science, but here is this gener generating sentences, and when children do it for themselves, they are reinventing the laws of English grammar, right, as a finite state automaton. Of course, it's not, you can't do all English sentences that way, but they're doing it in a, in a kind of engaging and fun way, and it sort of intersects with their English, perhaps. Okay, so, um, so that's so much about sort of what, what it is. Let me say something a little bit about what it isn't, because it's really important to position this stuff. Um, and in some ways, I'm rehearsing this for you, because I'm going to finish by asking all of you to get involved with this stuff. So you need to have a good story to tell and to position it well. So here's myth number one. The, the myth is it's all about computers, those sleek, beautiful devices that we stroke and have in our pockets and are inseparable from. But, so this is a very famous quote attributed to Dijkstra, where I don't know whether he really said it. Computer science is no more about computers than its astronomy is about telescopes. I really like it because it, it really conveys a core idea. Right? Computing is a bit more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. It would be um, really hard to envisage fun computer science without any computers. Um, but it does suggest that we should think hard about, going, uh, about not just focusing on technology, Right? The focus is on the ideas, and those ideas apply well beyond technological places. You can look at some of my colleagues at Microsoft are doing research in systems biology, where they're essentially regarding a cell as a computer, executing a program written in DNA, and they're writing programming languages that compile to DNA. Um, it's all right. Not as scary as it sounds. Um, but, uh, but you know, because you can see computation and information and communication everywhere once you put those three sets of lenses on your eyes. Uh, how do termites build those amazing mounds? They're running little programs, and somehow there's a distributed program that ends up with a termite mound. How does that happen? Uh, second myth, it's all about coding. Now, you'll have seen lots of this stuff, right? Why we should teach our kids to code. Indeed, if there's a single mantra about the change in uh, how we think about computing education, it would be this one, teaching our kids to code. Uh, but, but I think that it's about more than programming, right? So for me, programming is to computer science as lab work is to physics, right? Physics without lab work would be a dry, eviscerated husk of a subject. 
But you would no more put all your children in a lab full of inclined planes and stopwatches and expect them to reinvent Newton's laws of motion. That would not be a sensible thing to do, right? That you have to learn something about the underlying subject discipline as well. Same with computer science. So computer science without programming, ghastly, right? Programming without computer science, you know, just the job. <laughs> I mean, you're all computer scientists, really, like it or not. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I'm a bit worried that one outcome of all of this, you know, will be in 10 years' time, the Secretary of State for Education and say, will say, a triumph for, you know, England's uh, educational system, we, every child leads school able to program in Python. I do not want him to say that. Okay? Myth number two. Myth number three. Computer science is not for creative people. I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, but doesn't a new curriculum squeeze all the creativity out of it? I love this quote by Fred Brooks. I'm going to read it. The programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. She builds her castles in the air, from air, creating by exertion of the imagination. Few media of creation are so flexible, so easy to polish and rework, so readily capable of realizing grand conceptual structures. This is, by the way, a computer scientist speaking, the guy who wrote The Mythical Man Month, but he is lyrical on this subject, is he not? Um, so I think, you know, I look around this room and I think more, you know, more creative genius, more amazing ingenuity than you would see in almost any other room, you know, on the, on the planet. It's just, we, we build structures that are, that are not visible because they're encapsulated on USB sticks so tiny. My entire professional life is, would all fit on one USB stick, and yet those structures are more impressive than the Empire uh, State Building and are more impressive than a jumbo jet. They're gigantic. Um, and the limits are our own ability to manage complexity. And to manage that complexity, we have to go for conceptual clarity and elegance and modularity. So let's not have any of this stuff about computer science not being a creative subject. Right? Creativity is at the core. OK, last one. Um, it's all about the jobs. So it's, um, it is a bit about jobs, right? But it's, um, the, the new computing curriculum, at least in this country, is envisaged as being about helping children, whether or not they become the geeks of the future, to understand the world and have some agency in it, some power over it, while they believe that computers are magic, that is, created by wizards somewhere far away, over which they can utter spells, which they get from books, but if the spell doesn't work, then they're completely stuck, and, they, and, the, and the magic does things which they're, 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 over which they have no control. Rather than that, I want them to feel, oh, I understand something about how this works, and I can come to a critical evaluation of it. Um, but of course, it is about jobs too, but it's really about tomorrow's jobs, not today's, and it's about all jobs, not just the, the uh, software developers, not just the people in this room in particular, right? Design, engineering, fashion, marketing, all of those things need computing, and in fact, um, you know, I came across statistics saying you know, almost half the graduates who use computer science skills aren't even working in STEM, let alone be software developers. And moreover, there's this huge sort of gap, you know, huge need for people with these kind of skills. So you know, you know, you're going to get really well-paying jobs. So it's kind of like, it's so, it's, what's not to like? This is a slam dunk, right? Um, so here's the picture then of the big vision. This is my sort of retrospective picture. There's a sort of educational pillar about treating computer science as a foundational subject, and a kind of instrumental pillar that says this really will equip our children for their lives and for the jobs of the future. Um, and I just put this lovely quote by Richard Riley, who was a, um, he was an education secretary in the United States, but he wrote this lovely sort of aspirational story about what education is about. Okay. So far, so good. Now, uh, how are we going to get from, um, from where we are to, uh, to there? Well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, by way of context, the journey that we've been on in this country. So uh, the journey, at least for me at any rate, started in 2008 when I was, as I said in the video, talking to my children. I have six children, three of them biological and three more recently adopted. So the first three were the ones that made me so dissatisfied with ICT education, and the latter three are my regression tests. Um, because they are now um, eight and nine, so they are experiencing the new curriculum. Uh, so um, let's see. So, so there was a lot of 
hoo-ha around, around Henshaw, trying to, we formed a group to try to think, um, what should we do about the then ICT curriculum, wrote a curriculum for computer science as a subject, and then in the end, after a review of the national curriculum that was just coincidental but was really helpful to us, and a report by the, national, the Royal Society, we produced this curriculum. So this is the national curriculum for computing in England. It is only two sides long. The specification was, you can say what you like, Simon, and your committee, but it has to fit on two sides of A4 to cover 10 years of education. That specification concentrates the mind wonderfully. But here are the aims of the national curriculum, and uh, they say in black and white that every child, right, from age six, should understand the fundamental principles of computer science and should have repeated practical experience of writing programs to solve problems, having analyzed problems in computational terms. We haven't thrown ICT out, and uh, um, you know, it's not just computer science and no, no ap application. It's also lots of stuff about applying and evaluating information technology and being creative and safe users as well. So this is not gone, it's just this is the new piece. Does that make sense? That's the goal. That's the goal. Very well. This was, um, uh, where are we? You, know, you might think, job done, right? So uh, let's see, where, where are we? Uh, here. New curriculum launches, 2014, down tools, go back to work, go back to writing code. Um, but actually, um, not. So the Royal Society again produced a very helpful report. This is called After the Reboot. It was launched in November 2017. Um, and it's a sort of, you know, 100-page report that is a kind of state of the nation summary of what things look like, um, uh, you know, here, the national curriculum having launched here, right? And it, essentially, the, the one-line summary is patchy and fragile. That is, lots of good stuff to celebrate, but by no means universally applied across the country, and um, really challenging for school. So, um, so look, what is it? So only 10% uh, of students there about took a computer science GCSE, and over, only half the schools offered it even. So if you're in half schools, you couldn't even do a GCSE in computer science. Um, tremendous uh, underrepresentation of women. Um, is it true also of this room? So thank you, Francesco, for the diversity program in this. So, um, but that's a, so, you know, there's a whole chapter about that in this report. And particularly professional development for teachers is very inadequate. So um, we're asking teachers to do something really hard, which is to introduce a new subject into their school. Um, and so we need to help them to do that. Um, so um, that, led, that report then led to the government deciding to, remarkably, the government deciding to pay attention and fund some training for computing teachers. You might have thought they would have done that here, but they didn't. <laughs> but they did it here, and that's a lot better than nothing. So I am absolutely thrilled about the National Center for Computing Education. It's funded by, it's a really 100 million pounds across the um, four nations of the United Kingdom. 84 million pounds of that is for England. Um, so, and it's a four-year program, and its purpose is to support and equip and encourage and train schools and teachers to do a fantastic job of teaching the national curriculum in computing to all of their children in, across the entire country. Okay? So that is, it's rather amazing to have this at all. The government does not often cough up 100 million pounds when you ask. Uh, so just amazing. Um, now, but the scale is very big, right? There were 3,500 secondary schools, there were 16,000 primary schools, and a single cohort, one year group of children, is 600,000 children. So across this sort of 10 year span, that's 6 million children. So the scale is very large um, of, the, of the challenge that we're tackling here. Okay. Now, what is the National Center doing? This, so this, I'm very, um, uh, I'm sort of close to this because in the end, I was invited to become the, the non-executive chair of the National Center, which I'm completely bowled over and excited about. Here's what the National Center is doing. It is working through a network of 40 so-called computing hubs. Um, and these are schools. Right? This is not some external agency. These are schools that have applied to be a hub and they, they get money from the National Center to be essentially the computing experts in a local area. So they're geographically distributed around the country. So this is mandated by the Department of Education. That's what they wanted. And it has a lot of sense to it because it means if it's school-based hubs and most of the stuff is flowing through them, there's some chance that whatever is done will be useful and relevant to actual teachers rather than something done to them. Um, there's a, a lot of face-to-face -face and online training. Um, 
there's a going to be, there is coming and going to be a comprehensive resource repository. So what does that mean? It means highly curated lesson plans and schemes of work that will take, may take a teacher who doesn't necessarily know very much about the subject and say, here is one, one pathway that you can teach your subject, including, you know, right down to lesson by lesson plans and exercises and coursework and so forth. Okay, so um, it's not meant to be a straitjacket, it's meant to be a springboard. Um, as a, for A-level, there's a platform for, called the Isaac Computer Science Platform, and, uh, and this all complements the existing computing at school group. Remember, this, this uh, group that we started here with four people is a kind of grassroots guerrilla movement of volunteers. It now has about 30,000 members. All of you can join. It's not just school teachers. About at least a third of members are not school teachers. Anybody can join. It's easy, and you should. It's fun. Um, so there we go. That is what is... Um, happening. So let's just pause for a moment and stand back. Here is what has happened in 10 years. We've articulated a vision for computer science as a school subject, as a foundational discipline. We've got that vision embedded in national policy in the form of the national curriculum. And that is essentially established a completely new school subject. We don't normally get completely new school subjects. Um, into the school curriculum. This, is, this essentially is that. Um, I mentioned the, the um, computer at school community of practice. There's the uh, involvement in computer science GCSE, while it's not high enough, has nevertheless increased very sharply since 2013. Um, and then there's this professional development program. So when you show this to people in other countries, they think, wow, you guys in the UK, you are just doing so much so fast. Ten years is a really short time in education to get this kind of stuff done. However, there's a lot to do. That was the easy bit. That was the easy bit. Doing something, doing this in every school for every child is hard. Um, so even just taking that, that large sounding 80 million pounds and dividing it among 20,000 schools, well, that's 1,000 pounds per school per year, which is about enough to buy uh, you know, one of these um, every year. Uh, so it's not, that isn't a per school transformative amount. I think it will be transformative, but we can't just, what we cannot do is just say, ha, ah, problem sorted, the National Center for Commuting Education will do everything. It will not. Right? It relies on a lot of other people playing a role. So um, I also want to say a little bit about teachers. So I'm a school governor. Um, how many of you are school governors? Um, only one. Oh, wow. Guys, you should be school governors. This is really important. Um, teachers, hmm? What is a school governor? A school governor is like a school board. It's responsible, it's, a, it's lay. So some governors will be parents, some will be from the local community. And the head teacher essentially reports to the governing body. So it is in control of the school. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to get involved in your school. Um, and uh, it's both responsibility uh, and power, but mainly responsibility, <laughs> I have to tell you. But let me just remind you that being a teacher is really hard. Um, it is unremitting during term time, unremitting. Uh, if I have you know, three meetings in a day and I'm chairing one of them, I think I'm working hard. Teachers have six meetings a day and they're chairing all of them. Um, and you know, they're managing behavior and doing a zillion other things as well. Um, being a computing teacher is particularly hard because the subject's in flux. We're establishing this whole new subject. Um, pedagogy, we don't know very much about pedagogy. How do you teach computer science? The mathematicians have been trying to teach maths at school for centuries, and they still don't agree how to do it. For computer science, like we've only been doing it a few years, qualifications are changed, and there's a huge shortage of confident teachers, right? So usually if you're a math teacher, you'd find another confident math teacher in your school, not in computing. Um, and also it's quite... Quite, I think teachers often feel quite isolated. One teacher said to me, they said literally this, it's in my school, it's me, me, or me, right? They feel they're the only person. So it is quite hard. Um, but uh, that's, um, that's an opportunity too, right? So because I think that our teachers are a very high point of leverage, right? One inspired, equipped, valued, supported teacher will influence hundreds of of children every day and many thousands over their professional lifetime. Um, so I think our job as a you know, broadly drawn tech community, universities, professional societies, our job as the society that these teachers are embedded in is to put them in the position to be that inspiring teacher, 
Do you remember, remember the teacher from your past who you still remember and think back of as having made a difference to your life? That is why people are teachers, is because they know that they can make that difference in their children's lives. But we need to equip them to do that. So um, here is the picture that is in my mind. Right? There's this reservoir here right, of goodwill and expertise and, um, and commitment and energy. And it's sitting right here in this room. It's a visible reservoir. Right? And on the other hand, there's, there's um, schools and teachers who are passionate, committed. They have a lot of expertise um, in teaching, but they are hungry and thirsty for knowing you know, how to teach this new stuff. Right? So uh, I, well, I just want to introduce now a, a, an example of such a teacher. This is Terry Bennett. Um, uh, Terry, come up. So Terry is Francesco's children's head teacher. When Terry says jump, his children jump. In fact, when Terry says jump, I bet Francesco jumps too. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, come over here, Terry. Thank you very much for coming. Um, just tell us a little bit about your school, how big it is, what kind of school it is, and where it is. Okay, well, there's two schools. I'm an executive head teacher of two schools oh, in wow. Tower Hamlets. Uh, one's in Bethnal Green and one's in Shadwell, uh, near Pike Chapel. And uh, both, uh, they're both small schools. They're in areas of uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, but in areas of high deprivation. Uh, and they're small schools. And those, those two things are, are quite important, I think. And um, but by, by, by small, uh, we're primary, so we take children from three years old up to 11 years old, mm -hmm. and they, there is one class for each year group. So there's one class of three-year-olds, four-year-olds, yep. and five-year-olds, so on. Right. So just over 200 children and one teacher for each class. Great. Thanks. And, and now I've been ranting about the new computer curriculum and telling everybody how wonderful it is. How has it landed in your schools? Do you, do you as a head teacher and do your staff generally welcome it or do they hate it? Do they, you know, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Okay, lots of questions there. First thing to say is, I think it's absolutely brilliant. It was, uh, since we had the coalition government, without being political, it's been a hard time. It's been a hard time for everybody, but it, it feels especially so in education. With austerity, it's, it's affected schools, it's affected our budgets, it's affected our families, uh, and also with the, even the educational um, initiatives coming out, coming out of the government have not been helpful to someone like me in an area like where I am. So the, when I saw the new computing curriculum, it was a shining light in an otherwise very gloomy world. It, it did everything that I, I would have wanted it to do. What uh, Simon said earlier about the previous ICT curriculum is absolutely right. We were thinking, why on earth are we teaching this? And the children were thinking the same. I had children at school who were, who were learning this, and they're thinking, this is so uninspiring. It's not appropriate. It's not, what's the value in it? And there was very little value in it. So, the new curriculum was uh, brilliant, I, I'd say. It, it separated, out, out, separated out the applied and the pure. You, it was all about applications, and some of them woefully out of date as well previously, but it separated out the, the pure and the applied. Uh, it gave it meaning to, uh, to what the children were learning. Uh, the idea of the, com the uh, computational thinking, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And also, it, separated, it added in the digital, digital literacy. I just want to say, I've always been, for quite a long time, probably about 10 years, so probably when you were starting this project, I've been looking at what schools need for the future. And I came across some work by two North American educationalists called Chilling and Fidel. And I just want to read out, that this is what they thought should be the features of a 21st century curriculum. And just, in, in your mind, just think about how this ties in with the computing, just the computing curriculum. So they had three sets of skills, learning and innovation skills, within which there was critical thinking and problem solving, communication and collaboration, creativity and innovation. Then they had digital literacy skills, information literacy, media literacy, ICT literacy. And then they had career and life skills, flexibility and adaptability, initiative and self-direction, social and cross-cultural interaction, productivity and accountability, leadership and responsibility. Now, I think that the computing curriculum covers all of those points, and uh, I'm very grateful to Simon and his team for, for persuading the government to take that on. So thank you very much. Great, thanks. And one, one, one last thing, this picture. Does this picture fill you with uh, hope or with despair? That is, if the people in this room showed up in your school or, or said, Terry, how can we help? Well, would you think, uh, uh, go away or, or, or what? Uh, absolutely. The complete opposite. I would say, 
please, please do help us. Uh, I'd say get into schools and get into schools psychologically and physically. You covered some of the psychological by, telling, by explaining what it's like in schools. Those problems that you mentioned are magnified, I think, in small schools, and there's lots of small schools, across, certainly across London and across the country. Lots of the primary schools, schools are quite small. Our, there might be two form entry, we're a one form entry, there might be two form entry, but they're still small. That means that the teachers have to do, share the jobs out amongst themselves and do everything. So a primary school teacher teaches across the curriculum. You can't expect them to be specialists in everything. And the other thing is, there's, obviously, there's a training gap because none of the teachers went through any of this at all. So we've got something like a 15 or, so, or 20 year delay before the people coming through who've been through this program, who understand what it's about, will actually be in the position to teach it. So there's a real training gap, as you said. Uh, some teachers, mo teachers are actually positive in the same way as I am about what it's trying to do. But they don't have the skills, they don't have the knowledge, uh, and often they don't have the confidence to teach it either. So the training part is really important. So when you're when you're designing resources or apps for schools to use, make sure you're building some really clear training. Maybe attach videos that explain different parts of what's going on so teachers can quickly refer back to that rather than try and find someone who knows more about it than themselves. Uh, and also, if you can, get into schools. As a governor, uh, go into schools, spare, uh, spare an afternoon and go in and talk to children about your career paths, about uh, the importance of computing, about uh, its application in the wider world. Uh, if you, we have reading partners in school who come from companies, they, sp they give a, a, a lunchtime each week, one lunchtime a week, they go into school and read with children. Why can't you, can you go into school one lunchtime a week and do some coding with children? Just get, in, so get into schools, get, see what's needed, uh, and see in any way you can help, we'll, we would, we'd love you to be involved in schools. And just one, sorry, one last thing, and that is that you saw that the curriculum starts at six years old. Uh, you talked about early years, Simon, but Start, maybe you're do, sorry if I'm patronising you in, in any of this. Maybe you're doing all these things already, and, so, and thank you if you are. But what about the children before they even come to school, before they even get to school? Children start off, at, there, there's good research saying that children think computationally when they're learning that language right from the, their birth. So their, their brains, so for example, they're picking up grammar and vocabulary by using statistical analysis. So I, maybe you're doing this, but how about some preschool work that, you can, that we can give to families. or t We take children at three, we want to take children at two. Children are coming to school with some uh, real difficulties in their language and their cognitive abilities. So if you, can start, if you can start looking at preschool children, even better. Start early, great. Thank you so much, Terry. Okay. Give Terry a hand. <laughs> Thanks. For me, teachers are the heroes and heroines of this particular saga, and head teachers in particular have a really tough job. So thank you, Terry, for, for coming today. Um, so enough with the talking, right? This is we're sort of um, I, I, it, just at the moment we stand at a kind of watershed. Um, there's a there's lots of inspiration and opportunity which we've been talking about, but there is also anxiety, stress, and fear among teachers because they're being asked to do something that they you know, have not been equipped by training or background to do. Um, so there's a lot to play for, because if this lands well, then I think our, children, you know, our teachers will be excited about it, and our children will get a better education. Um, so we can either wait for somebody else to do something, um, or we can roll up our sleeves and uh, do something about it ourselves. And I vote for B, right? So I'm going to just give you a couple of clues about what B might involve. Um, so here are some things. Number one, you need to be proactive. It's not enough to sit and wait for Terry to phone you up, right? You have to go and meet him. Um, so no one, and, and nor is there some smooth, smoothly functioning central bureaucracy that will tell you what to do. There's a bit of one, but mostly it really makes a difference if you take an initiative initiatives yourselves. Secondly, you have to make it sustained. It's no good showing up in Terry's school all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and saying, we'll do this and that, and then six months later, you're gone. You've just consumed a lot of his time, got him revved up, and then let him down, right? So you must, you must do things that you feel able to sustain, and that often means working with other people. Third thing, don't reinvent the wheel. This means that companies particularly, individuals not so much, companies particularly like inventing a shiny new thing, right? A new program, a new thing. 
But there's a very big and confusing landscape, if you're a teacher, of offers of one, one kind or another. So it's much easier for schools and teachers if you're part of some, you know, some existing program than if you're starting something completely new that, that, uh, you know, that may or may not be here next year. Last thing, education is awfully complicated. There aren't really any silver bullets. So that means we need to be pretty humble about this. We need to sit alongside teachers and listen to what they say and actually hear them. Right? We can't, uh, there's going to be no single answer. Um, and we need to continually adapt what we do to when we find that it didn't work as well as we thought. Um, so a lot of humility is needed. But bottom line is, don't just sit there, do something. Uh, so let me give you two, there's two slides worth of things you could do. Um, now, this is things you could do as an individual. So there are lots of volunteering opportunities. Um, I put top of the list here, find a school, right, and get alongside the teacher. So become a governor actually could be, um, could be one such example, but you don't have to be. That's a sort of high-end version that give, makes, gives you quite a long sustained commitment. Just by meeting some of the teachers meet in a primary school, meet the head teacher, and then perhaps their, some of their immediate colleagues, get alongside them, find out what they want, form a relationship with them, so you're not doing something to them, you're doing something with them. Um, in, in sort of process terms, becoming a STEM ambassador is a fantastic thing to do. STEM ambassadors are the, which is run by this outfit, STEM Learning, um, uh, which is STEM, I forgot to say, the National Center isn't a separate um, legal entity. The National Center for Computing Education is simply a collaboration between STEM Learning, the British Computer Society, BCS, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So it's these three organizations that have come together to do the National Center. So STEM Learning, huge partner. Um, and being a STEM ambassador means you get, uh, you get CRB checked, you get access to all sorts of you know, one-off opportunities. And it's a sort of jumping off point for almost everything else. Most of the other things you might do will say, please become a STEM ambassador first. So please do that. Um, there's a very active and, and uh, long-running program now called Barefoot. Um, this is along the analogy of barefoot doctors in, the, um, in uh, developing countries, where the idea was it's better to have 100 barefoot doctors who know, how to, um, you know, who know elementary medicine than one high-powered doctor who can only see you know, a few people. Right? So this is barefoot volunteers who run around primary schools giving essentially training courses for teachers. Um, and it's well resourced, so you don't have to invent the training course, right? They, they sort of shrink that. You, you, you can just deliver it. Um, no. This is barefoot here, easy to search for. Um, running a code club. Code clubs are typically school based. Um, code club, incidentally, was started by two women working in IT uh, about eight years ago or so. Um, it's been, it's, and, and it's now, so it started with one school. It now runs in. Tens of, is it more than 10,000 schools world, worldwide? Certainly, it's, you know, many, many thousands of schools across the country. Um, and uh, it's typically an after-school or lunchtime programming club. It does, and volunteers um, have to show up regularly. Typically, there's a teacher there as well. You're not required to do crowd control. So these are typically a school linked. Code to Dojo typically have a, a more sort of parent and child cut up opportunities. More typically happen a weekend, sort of monthly. So again, just you know, look, look these things up. And they're even collected here as a couple of links, right? So this one is the sort of NCCE's Get Involved page. This one is more local because many of you here will be from London. This is Teach London Computing, which is a, the um, uh, the sort of local, what you can do as a, as a volunteer thing. So here's another link. I'll, I'll leave them on my final slide, and they'll be readily available afterwards. So that's as an individual, right? Individuals could do a lot. You know, walk out of this room and do something. But it's even better if you can get involved somehow as a group, perhaps in your um, company or with your colleagues, right? Why is that better? I think it's because we can promise more if we work together than we can individually. As an individual, I can say, I'll try to come, but I might be in America that time, or I might be on holiday. You know, things might happen. As a group, you can say, we will commit to being in your class or at this code club every Friday at 4 or whatever it is, because there's a group of you, so collectively you can manage it. And it's even better if it has the sort of air cover from your company saying, yes, this is something that we want to do. And we, actually, companies are remarkably supportive of all this. Right? They'll say, if you say, this is something we'd like to do, they'll often give you, you know, work time off to do it. Um, companies are often helpful. But they, it's really important, though, for you to lead on this. Don't wait for your company to tell you what to do. Just start a group. 
And I think you may find that your employer is, and maybe you are the employer. Probably half of you are CTOs of your own companies. That's even better, right? So, um, uh, but, I've, but I'm, I'm trying to say, don't wait. Do involve your company because it means you can sustain more over a longer period. Um, and that's really helpful for schools. They're more likely to believe in you and to commit to the relationship if they have confidence that it's going to go on. Plus, of course, it's fantastic to say, oh, you know, we're working with this local company. Schools love that too, don't they? <laughs> okay, as an individual, as a company. After this talk, um, Wendy, Wendy and Steve and Simon, could you just stand up? Um, where they're, they're sitting at the back here. So Wendy's from um, BCS. Steve and Simon are from STEM Learning. They're going to be through that wall um, on the tables just, just at, the, at the back of this room. So they'll be there with lots of handouts so you can talk to them um, about you know, specifics. You can talk to me as well, but I, I would just thought it would be helpful to have a bit more bandwidth so if you think I could actually do something here. Please talk to Terry as well. Right? I'm hoping that he's going to walk out of here with a few business cards in his pocket. Um, and also, Suze, are you here? Sue, Sue, stand up, please. So Sue, Sue Shardlow um, wrote to me a couple of days ago. She's, uh, she runs or is involved in Women, women Who Code? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. It's women, who code women Who Code London runs Women Who Code London. Great. So Sue's is here as well. If you sort of hang out in the same general area, please talk to her as, her as well. So uh, um, because in the end, it's all about relationships, isn't it? So it's quite helpful to have a few faces here. OK. Please do something. I just want to finish, though by coming back to where we started. That's our children. This is a little story from a workshop that um, uh, Kaz ran in London about uh, five years ago, I think. Um, this fellow is Miles Berry, um, uh, who is a, uh, works in an um, educational ed education and training at Roehampton University. And he ran a workshop for these children, at which one child um, realized that she was programming in Scratch. And she realized she could take this sequence of turtle commands and she could, nobody told her this, she found this for loop tile that was sort of off to the left, and she dragged it across and thought, maybe it'll make things happen. She found she could draw a square with a loop rather than just by writing the things out. And she was, so she tried this, and it worked, and then she told the rest of her group. Um, and that was, that was quite exciting all, all the while. But this is what was really amazing. Her teacher wrote to Miles a few weeks later to say this. Here I have M, self-esteem going through the roof. She has associated this computing success with maths. Over the last couple of weeks, she's solved maths problem after problem, met target after target. She's truly flying. She is going great because of a positive experience in a computing workshop in London. I find this really touching. I think, oh, this is actually what it's all about. It's about giving children, perhaps quite young children, confidence to do things that they didn't know that they could do and explore the, you know, the amazing new world that we live in. We are fortunate enough to live in. So this is what it's all about. Um, I do want our children to be you know, engaged and curious and creative and playful and informed and empowered. And yes, I do want them to have jobs. So please, I, I'm, I, I hope you're going to leave this room and do something. It doesn't have to be much. It has to be something you can sustain but do something. I think that you can make a difference. Uh, here, here are a couple of links uh, to just remind you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, yeah. Do you want to run around with the microphone? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. That was uh, really inspiring. Um, I was just wondering, outside of um, formal education, how you approached teaching uh, CS concepts to your own children, um, if you did that at all, and sort of uh, how you... How you approached te teaching computer science concepts out so, of, as, outside yeah, formal education. As a education. parent, if you, if you try to sort of teach that outside of school. One of the great things that's happened in the last decade and a half is that there are now a lot of programming environments designed specifically for children. Scratch is just one, and there are, you know, Tinker is another, and there's, there's, there's uh, Greenfoot is another. There's really quite a lot. So, um, and although I've, I've concentrated on the taught curriculum, because there we get scale and equity, it's for every child, but there's a huge array of extracurricular stuff that's already going on. Code Dojo and Code Club are just examples, and there's a lot more. So, yes, I think there's, there's 
gobs of material and gobs of, um, uh, of um, you know, actually platforms um, like Scratch to help you do that. So, yes, I'm not, I, I'm not at all wanting to downplay that. That's absolutely fantastic. Which is what I want to do both. Well, thanks, Simon. This is a really exciting initiative. Uh, as we all know, computer science is an ever-evolving subject. So how, what, what's your vision of keeping the curriculum up to date uh, while you... Oh, co computing is a rapidly evolving subject. Well, that is true, and it's also not true. Right? When I speak about, you know, you talk about the traveling salesman problem, I could have said that 20 years ago. Um, and it would have been just as true. So in some ways, the, we, when, when drafting that two pages of national curriculum, we were consciously trying to think, what will this look like in 10 years' time? Would it, will it make sense in 10 years' time? For example, we carefully avoided saying anything about mobile, which was terribly trendy at the time, um, because we thought it'll probably go out of fashion. The, um, these days, we might you know, try, try to be careful not to say too much about AI, because that will change too, though I think data science will remain very... So, so yes, the subject changes in its, its, changes its spots, but its fundamentals don't change. I think its fundamentals probably will change more rapidly than physics, right? because you know, the under, you know, like, like we might want to put a heavier emphasis on um, uh, statistics in order to support data science and machine learning kind of things, which is a completely different way of even thinking about computation. But, um, but I think those, those changes will be slower and we could adapt to them. In other words, I, I, don't, I think we must avoid giving the impression that it changes every year and so you need to retrain your teachers every year. I think if we, if we concentrate on the fundamentals and then say, but we, we, uh, the context, we contextualize it in a different way each year, that's much more reassuring, I think, and I think even more true. Yeah. And if I'm allowed to add to that, yeah. I think one of the key things in computer science is you don't teach someone computer science, you teach them to learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think, one of the key things when you're working with children, because, yeah, what, what they're learning, you know, will be, at least in universities, what we learn is obsolete by the time we graduate. Uh, it's true and in every we subject, need to be actually. Exactly. Yeah. So His, we need to be in able history, to hang along and, yeah. And in history, they teach a lot about critical evaluation of sources. Right? We they don't just teach you the dates, right? So that when you are learning new history, you know what to do. Yes, somebody oh, else. We learn from history. Another we learn question? nothing from history. Yep. There's a question here. Hi. Thank you for this talk. It was very, uh, yeah, inspiring. So I, I live in Norway, and I have a, a six-year-old in school myself right now. Um, I'm wondering where, where might I find the curriculum that's actually used in the classroom for, for example, six-year-olds uh, in the UK. So I, I would like to read that and, and oh, okay. maybe yes. bring some back home to Norway. Um, yes, so uh, I, have, I have a page of, of key links. So if you, look, if you search for Simon Peyton Jones Computing at School, I think you'll find my key links page, which links to all sorts of things. If you search for National Curriculum Computing, you'll find the two pages. The National Center itself will produce this resource repository. Right? It's, it will be done by the end of Ju by July next year. And that will be a detailed exposition of exactly, I mean, the National Curriculum, remember, two pages. Um, the resource repository will, will be you know, lesson by lesson. So, and then there's everything in between. So there's a couple of starting points. I'll keep my key links page up to, up to scratch. I'll add a link. Uh, Francesco, these slides can be available afterwards, can't they? So I'll maybe add a link to my sort of key links page, which is a good jumping off place. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. Inspiring. Um, do you think the National Center will have the resources or opportunity to infect the other parts of the curriculum, change the way it's taught, or provide tools or resources to? Will to the, so you're asking, will the National, the, the, the computing curriculum, or perhaps the National Center in particular, somehow infect the rest of the taught curriculum? So there are two things here. One is, um, when we began all this, a lot of people confused ICT as a discrete subject, well, computing as a discrete subject, with um, information and communication technology used to improve teaching and learning across the curriculum, right? So I, that's kind of ed tech, if you like. You're a better historian if you make good use of IT tools to let you find new sources and so forth. So I think it's really important to keep those separate, right? If you're a, a confident user, you'll be better at this ed tech stuff. Um, but, it, but, but if we mix them up, right, if we say, oh, we can teach computing by just teaching it in history, we're really going to fail. So that's number one. But number two is, 
what could we, I mean, computing is a inherently kind of interdisciplinary kind of thing. It's infecting all other subjects. Nowadays, if you're a biologist, you're probably spending a lot of, the, lot of your time writing or interacting with software, right? So perhaps we could see more computing you know, bleeding into other subjects, as it were. So I think that's, uh, and I've often wondered whether, at least at key stage three, the first part of primary school, the first part of secondary school, you could teach maths and computing, for example, as a single subject, rather than as two separate silos. That would be quite exciting. But in the, in the sort of short term, in the framework of the National Center, the next four years, that will be, I think, too ambitious. Just establishing computing as a discrete subject and knowing what it means and how to teach it, that's really hard in every school for every child. So, so yes, but one thing at a time. <laughs> if you're a you know, secure school that's doing well, do, do this bleeding stuff, yeah. OK, let's hear it for Simon and Terry Bennett. Thank you okay, so good. much.